Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India series in renal pathology and today we'll be talking about renal tumors. So in 2016 itself an update to the classification of renal tumors came in from WHO which looked at both epithelial and mesenchymal benign and malignant tumors and we'll look at that in some detail later. Let us start with renal cell carcinoma. Uh, renal cell carcinoma is the most common malignant tumor arising in the kidney and it contributes to 85% of all primary renal neoplasms in adults. Uh, initially, it was considered to actually have an origin in adrenal rests uh, within the kidney, which is why it was called hypernephroma. This was, of course, because of the yellow color of most of the RCCs. But in 1959, Oberling and colleagues determined that these tumors arise from renal cells rather than from adrenal rests. Uh, in terms of etiology, there are a large number of environmental factors, including cigarette smoking, unopposed estrogen therapy, exposure to petroleum products and heavy metals including asbestos and also an increased association with end-stage renal disease. Acquired cystic disease which uh, tends to occur in patients on chronic dialysis because of chronic kidney disease is another condition complicated by RCC. Also some cases of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and tuberous sclerosis are known to develop renal cell carcinomas. Most of RCCs remain sporadic, that's approximately 96%, but in 4% of patients there is a familial tendency which is usually inherited as an autosomal dominant disease. And let's look at the important syndromes to remember. First and foremost is a von Hippel-Lindau syndrome or the VHL syndrome, which is associated with conventional or clear cell RCCs. Hereditary leomyomatosis and renal cell cancer syndrome, which was newly incorporated into the 2016 WHO classification. This is associated with a mutation in the fumarate hydratase gene and predisposes to papillary carcinomas. Then you have the hereditary papillary carcinoma, which is associated with uh, activation of the MET proto-oncogene. And we have the bert hogg dube syndrome, which... Uh, is associated with mutations in the folliculin gene and therefore numerous skin tumors uh, and associated renal tumors of varied histology. So we look at uh, some of the important familial syndromes as we go along the lecture. So what are the important clinical features of renal cell cancer? There's a classical triad which is described of hematuria, pain as well as an abdominal mass which is found in only 9% of patients. Hematuria remains the most common a presenting feature uh, in RCCs and RCCs also can present with a lot of paraneoplastic syndromes which is why it is really called uh, one of the greatest mimics in medicine. Patients could present with polyneuromyopathy, hepatic dysfunction, GI disturbances, hypercalcemia due to release of a parathyroid hormone like uh, protein, hypertension due to renin production, polycythemia due to erythropoietin production, Canacomastia or even Cushing syndrome. Males remain affected twice as more as females and the peak incidence of RCCs is in the 6th and 7th decade. Of course, in the familial syndromes as I had described, patients tend to be younger, uh, the tumors tend to be bilateral and can also be multifocal. So let's look at conventional or clear cell renal cell carcinoma. The cell of, the, uh, cell of origin of this tumor is from the proximal convoluted tubule. And whether it's sporadic or familial, really, conventional RCCs have been most consistently associated with mutations in the short arm of chromosome 3, which houses the VHL gene. So what really happens when this VHL gene is deleted or mutated? The VHL gene encodes for an important part of the proteasome. The proteasome is physiologically responsible for degradation of ubiquitin TAD proteins which are ready for proteolysis. If the VHL gene is abnormal or deleted, the proteasome is not properly functional and an important protein which is HIF or hypoxia inducible factor 1 
doesn't undergo its normal degradation. Accumulation of HIF1, which is a pro-antigenic factor, causes downstream activation and production of more antigenic factors like VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor, for example, which predisposes to formation of these highly vascular tumors, one of which, of course, is the conventional of VSL RCC, and we'll see its morphology. So, the VHL cancer syndrome is an autosomal dominant inherited syndrome, and it's characterized by the development of these vascular tumors, including conventional RCCs along with multiple bilateral renal cysts and hemangioblastomas in the retina and in the cerebellum, along with other tumors like pheochromocytomas, endocrine pancreatic tumors, and epididymal cyst adenomas. But it's easy for us to remember the vascular tumors as it's associated with the pathogenesis. Now we move on to the gross appearance of clear cell RCC. You can see that the poles tend to be more commonly involved. Here we have a tumor in the upper pole on the left and a tumor in the lower pole on the right. Both these tumors are relatively well circumscribed and they have a cut surface which is classically described as variegated as they have different types of areas on the cut surface. We have the yellowish areas, we have the more hemorrhagic areas and some more solid areas along with evidence of cystic change. Why are clear cell RCCs yellow? This is because of the clear cytoplasm of the tumor cells, which is lipid rich. So that's what fat looks like on gross, it looks yellow. Here we can see the classical morphology of a conventional RCC. We have these polygonal cells with well-defined cell borders, centrally placed small nuclei, and we may see prominent uh, nucleoli as the tumor gets to a higher grade. And these uh, nests and sheets of cells are separated by these fibrovascular septa with very rich vascularity. Here on the left, you can see the tumor encircling a normal glomerulus in the adjacent kidney. And on high power, we can see the same appearance of these vegetable type like cells, their abundant clear cytoplasm, and the centrally placed nuclei. In 3 to 6% of patients, you can have extensive cystic change and this is known as multilocular cystic RCC. This tends to occur at the similar uh, age at which RCCs present and all we see are these thin fibrous septae lining these cysts and these uh, septae are lined by the neoplastic clear epithelial cells and may sometimes be missed. Let's move on to papillary renal cell carcinoma. This is the second most common type of RCC found in 7 to 14 percent of cases. Grossly, really, we cannot differentiate uh, unless we do see some gross evidence of papillary formation. Papillary RCCs have a better prognosis than conventional RCCs, and their cell of origin is purported to be from the distal convoluted tubule. Just like conventional RCCs, papillary RCCs have a classic cytogenetic abnormality. It's usually a trisomy of chromosome 7 and 17 with a deletion in Y. This trisomy which occurs in the chromosome 7, results in activation of the met proto-oncogene, which downstream results in the formation of papillary RCCs. Of course, if there's a germline mutation in met, that will result in, again, multifocal bilateral tumors presenting at a younger age. The other familial syndrome that we had discussed with papillary RCC is the hereditary leomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma syndrome. And as I had mentioned earlier, that's because of a mutation in the fumarate hydratase gene. And this forms a really aggressive form of papillary RCC. Even in the non-familiar forms, that is in sporadic papillary tumors, you do see evidence of uh, met proto-oncogene activation. Morphologically, we divide papillary RCCs into type 1 and type 2. Type 1 has papillary lined by a single layer of cells which have scant and pale cytoplasm. Whereas in type 2, you see pseudostratification in the epithelium and you have cells with more abundant acetophilic cytoplasm. So here, for example, you have uh, a type 1 papillary RCC to the left. And you can see another classical feature wherein the fibrovascular stalks of the papillae are uh, filled with these foamy macrophages. And then we have an example of a type 2 with more stratified epithelium and abundant acetophilic cytoplasm. Let's move on to chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. Uh, this comprises 6 to 11% of RCC cases. 
The cell of origin is thought to be from the intercalated cells of the collecting ducts. Males and females are equally affected. The mean age remains similar. And this has a better prognosis than both conventional as well as papillary renal cell tumors. In terms of genetics, multiple chromosomal losses and extreme hypodiploidy is described, but no classical uh, genetic mutations are described as uh, is noted in conventional or papillary RCC. The gross appearance of chromophore RCCs, these slow growing tumors, it's very classical. They tend to be solid, they tend to be mahogany brown. Uh, or tan colored on cut surface and they may even show you a central scar in some cases evidence of their slowly growing nature and what do they look like on microscopy you see a more solid proliferation of cells which are again polygonal just like in the conventional RCC uh, but the nuclei tend to be more wrinkled with irregular nuclear membranes and they tend to show a perinuclear halo this perinuclear halo is because of accumulation of small mucin vacuoles, which can be detected on Hale's colloidal iron stain, as we can see here, this blue staining that is noted in the cytoplasm. Uh, it also has a classical ultrastructural appearance, where the cytoplasm is full of these small vacuoles, which are what contain mucin and are picked up by the special stain, as I had just described. The next variant is collecting duct carcinoma. This is a relatively uncommon form of renal cell carcinoma with aggressive behavior. Uh, again, it can show several chromosomal losses, but nothing very specific. Uh, it tends to arise from the principal cells of the medullary collecting duct, and therefore it tends to have a gross appearance which is limited to the medulla. As we can see here on the left in this gross picture, we have a more solid appearing tumor, which is localized to the medulla. And if we look at the microscopic appearance, we see these ductal structures lined by high grade nuclei associated with a uh, marked inflammatory infiltrate as well as a desmoplastic response. Renal medullary carcinoma is morphologically very similar to collecting duct carcinoma. It has a similar gross appearance with the tumor being limited to the medulla, but it has a classical clinical presentation of patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, it tends to have an aggressive course and a very similar appearance as I had described. RCC have now been added in the new classification, including enzyme deficient RCCs, which is the succinate dehydrogenase deficient tumors, translocation carcinomas, including the XP11.2, among others. Let's now move on to prognostic factors in a renal cell tumor. First and foremost is stage. This is the most important prognostic factor in this tumor as with other tumors in other parts of the body. What's interesting is that RCCs have a tendency to metastasize widely through the renal vein. And in 25% of patients with RCC, the presentation could be with metastasis. The most common site of metastasis is lung, followed by bone, uh, the abdominal lymph nodes, adrenal gland, and even the brain. If we look at the tumor type, Overall, uh, five-year survival for RCCs is between 70 to 90 percent, but uh, conventional RCCs have a slightly different uh, five-year survival between 43 and 89 percent, followed by papillary, as you can see here, and chromophobe. Chromophobe RCCs, therefore, have the best prognosis, followed by papillary, and then conventional in that order. The next important prognostic factor is the tumor grade which is determined by Fermin's nuclear grade when we look at the details. And then we look for presence or absence of sarcomatoid change in this epithelial tumor. So let's look at the staging and how renal cell tumors are staged. Stage 1 tumors are tumors which are less than 7 cm in greatest dimension and limited to the kidney, as we can see here. These patients have a 5-year survival of approximately 95%. Stage 2 are just larger tumors, more than 7 cm, but still limited to the kidney. Five-year survival is a little less, to 88%. By stage 3, the tumor has started spreading. The tumor is present either in the major veins, or has shown local extension to the adrenal gland, or it has shown perirenal extension, but it is still limited by the gerota's fascia, or at least one regional lymph node is now involved. This has a 5-year survival of 59%.
by stage 4 renal uh, cell tumor the tumor has now gone beyond the genital fascia or has involved more than one regional lymph node and you can see that the fiber survival is significantly lower at 20% the ferments nuclear grading in rcc uh, divides RCCs into four grades based on the appearance of the nucleus, the nucleus size, as well as the nucleoli. To remember easily, in grade one, you have round uniform nuclei, which are small, with absent or inconspicuous nucleoli. By grade two, the nucleus becomes slightly irregular, and the nucleoli become evident, but only on a high power, that is a 40x magnification. By grade 3, they are very irregular, larger, with large and prominent nuclei, evident even on low power, that is a 10x magnification. And grade 4 is easy to pick up. It has bizarre, multilobated, large nuclei with very prominent nucleoli and chromatin clumping. As you can see, really in RCCs, it's a grade 2 and grade 3, which are the most common uh, grades of presentation. I discussed sarcomatoid change as an important prognostic factor and we must always give a percentage if there is sarcomatoid transformation in the tumor. And this is what it looks like. Really, it looks like a sarcoma. And you may uh, find the only evidence of epithelial differentiation would be on immunohistochemistry with some epithelial markers. On the right, you have a sarcomatoid RCC with a pleomorphic giant cell appearance. So it, is, it can look really, really pleomorphic. There are some indicators even on gross. Uh, when, a, when a tumor has sarcomatoid uh, areas, those areas may have a very white fibrous appearance. Now let's look at an important benign tumor of the kidney that is the renal oncocytoma. If you look at the gross appearance, it's really reminiscent of the chromophobe renal cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, it also has a well circumscribed appearance with a mahogany or a tan cut surface and can also show you the presence of a central scar. So these two tumors are really a gross differential diagnosis of each other. If you look at the morphology, however, there are major differences. An oncocytoma uh, tends to show very uniform cells. The nuclei have a very neuroendocrine character uh, to them with salt and peppery chromatin and inconspicuous nucleoli. So we don't have really the irregular hyperchromatic nuclei of a chromophobe RCC. If you look at the cytoplasm, it tends to be abundant eosinophilic and granular, unlike a chromophobe RCC, which has clear areas, particularly perinuclear halos. If you look at the ultrastructural appearance in an oncocytoma, the granular eosinophilic cytoplasm is really due to numerous mitochondria, whereas in a chromophobe RCC, we had seen the presence of mucin vacuoles. So these are important differences to remember between the two tumors. I am now going to move on to urothelial carcinoma of the renal pelvis. This constitutes a small 7% of all renal cell tumors. And as I described in my previous lectures, there may be a history of analgesic nephropathy in a small percentage of patients uh, with or without papillary necrosis, which is found in one fourth of cases. Grossly, the tumor would be soft and grayish red. Mm -hmm and would really resemble a transitional cell carcinoma of bladder. You may therefore see papillary projections. Microscopically, it would really resemble a transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder, and majority of them uh, tend to really be high-grade papillary urothelial carcinomas, and the standard treatment would include, similar to RCCs, a nephro-urethrectomy. So here we have a gross appearance of the uh, TCC of the renal pelvis, and you can see these fleshy papillary projections and you can see that the tumor is present in the pelvic region. Let's now move on to some childhood renal tumors. There's a long list here, the first of which is Wilms tumor. You can also have renal lymphomas or leukemias. Uh, RCCs can present in childhood, particularly when there's a genetic issue there. Clear cell sarcoma of the kidney or CCSK. Mesoblastic nephroma and rhabdoid tumor constitute really the classical childhood renal tumors. Let's look at Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor is the most common primary kidney tumor in children, occurs commonly in the age group of 2 to 5 years and is associated with mutations in the WT1, it's a Wilms tumor 1 gene. There are three important syndromes which are associated with Wilms tumor uh, gene mutations. 
and they tend to have a risk of Wilms tumor and a variety of congenital malformations. So let's look at the first syndrome that is the Vagar syndrome. It's associated with the WT1 mutation which is on chromosome 11 and the associated malformations include aniridia that is the A, genital abnormalities that is the G and retardation, mental retardation that is the R. So that's Vagar syndrome. The next important syndrome is the Dennis Rash syndrome which is again a WT1 mutation. And it is associated with gonadal dysgenesis and other renal abnormalities in the form of diffuse mesangial sclerosis or DMS. We then have the Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. This is due to a WT2 mutation, the Wilms tumor gene 2. And it's characterized along with Wilms tumor. The patient has enlarged body organs, including tongue, kidney and liver. This tends to happen in half of the body. That's why it's called hemihypertrophy. And you can also have adrenal enlargement. So how do these patients present? Usually there is presentation with a large abdominal mass. It may be so large in some cases that it may cross the midline. The child may uh, have history suggestive of hematuria and intestinal obstruction if it's a very large abdominal tumor. However, the prognosis of this tumor is good, especially with current chemotherapy regimens and a two-year survival of up to 90% is seen. That's the gross appearance of a Wilms tumor and you can see that there are some areas of hemorrhage along with solid looking areas in this tumor. And on microscopy, it is classically described as a triphasic tumor. The first uh, part of the tumor usually that you note is the malignant round cell tumor areas which is also called the blastemal component. And they, then you may find evidence of epithelial differentiation which is usually tubular as well as evidence of mesenchymal differentiation with the spindle cell component. In some cases, you may have only a biphasic tumor, which is usually blastemal and epithelial, and rarely you may have uniphasic or a blastema dominant tumor. So when we do look at Wilms tumor, other than looking at its morphology, we also have to demonstrate presence or absence of diffuse anaplasia, which is a very important prognostic factor, and we look at that uh, in detail later. So how do we stage Wilms tumor? It's a little different uh, from the adult RCC uh, staging system. Stage 1 is limited to the kidney and completely resected. Stage 2 has gone outside the kidney but is completely resected. In stage 3, it's confined to the abdomen. Stage 4 shows hematogenous metastasis. And stage 5 is bilateral, either initially or during treatment. We now know that the overall survival <laughs> is more than 90%. This is usually in tumors which have favorable histology. That is, they show absence of diffuse anaplasia. And after successful surgery, chemo and radiation therapy. Those patients which have diffuse anaplasia, which is an unfavorable histological feature, tend to have relatively high mortality. So to summarize, the kidney is affected by a wide variety of tumors. And here I leave you with the WHO 2016 update of renal tumors. Thank you.